All right, hello. Doing okay? Not really. Got a test this week. <laughs> Sorry. Starts on uh, Thursday, goes through Friday. I think in the spring summer term there is no late fee, so that's pretty good. However, the hours at the testing center are different during spring term than they are during the regular semester because everything is different. So just pay attention to that. If you show up at the testing center at 8 p.m. on Friday, I think it's closed at then. So closed at that point. So avoid that moment of horror and just pay attention to the um, hours ahead of time. All right, with um, chapter 14, we just want to finish up a couple of things and then we'll move on to carboxylic acids in chapter 15. The good news is chapter 15 is a breath of fresh air since it's stuff that you've basically seen before, so it's a bit of review. All right, we were talking about aldehyde and ketone chemistry. Um, one, the, the last two things we need to talk about in this chapter are, an, a, bit, uh, are a bit of an aside because the theme so far has been adding things like alcohols or amines to, to ketones and aldehydes where we need to protonate the carbonyl group first. Um, and the, the last couple of things are in the chapter but don't really fit in with that theme, so they may be a little bit out of place. Uh, the first is going to be called cyanohydrin formation, and all this is is addition of CN minus as a nucleophile to an aldehyde or a ketone. So, for example, if you take this aldehyde and you add, sodium is just the counter ion, CN minus is the nucleophile. You also need HCl. You gotta be a little bit careful here when you do this reaction because uh, HCN, if you protonate CN minus, you generate hydrogen cyanide gas, which is toxic. Um, so I don't think anybody, I've never done this reaction. I, I, there are probably better ways to do the reaction that um, don't involve potentially toxic amounts of a fatal gas, or fatal amounts of a toxic gas. But you make a bond between the carbon of cyanide and what used to be the carbonyl carbon. That new bond is highlighted in red. Um, the mechanism here is not totally clear whether you have to protonate first or uh, after or during. Uh, we'll just go with sort of during uh, to make things simple. Your text may show something a little bit different. I'm okay with either one. Protonating first would mean we generate the oxonium ion and then CN minus attacks. Um, <coughs> Anyway, you generate this product that is called a cyanohydrin. And these are useful because you can actually take uh, acid under and then add heat. Organic chemists use the delta symbol for heat, I think because it looks like a fire, I don't know. Uh, and you can hydrolyze the amide to the carboxylic acid. I'm not going to show you the mechanism of that reaction. It's not hard, but um, we won't worry about it. Perhaps in chapter 16, if we have extra time, I'll, I'll show it to you. For now, you can tell that this reaction doesn't involve any oxidation or reduction because CN, the cyanide group had three bonds between carbon and a heteroatom and so does the carboxylic acid, so we've stayed at the same oxidation state. Um, and you can use these, uh, the product here is an alpha hydroxy acid, and those have some interesting uses. So that's probably not the biggest and most important reaction that we could talk about, but it's one that your text mentions, and one that occasionally appears in synthesis problems in your text, so I wanted you to be aware of it. All right, any, anything you want to ask about that one? Yes? So even though the cyanide has a negative charge, it's acting as kind of like a 
yeah, even though cyanide has a negative charge, is it acting as a weak nucleophile? Frankly, I wouldn't, it wouldn't bother me, and your text may actually show this if you attacked directly. CN minus is the conjugate base of HCN, that toxic hydrogen cyanide gas that I told you about, and it has a pKa of around nine. So it's a lot better than, say, CN minus, that means is a lot better of a nucleophile than water or an alcohol, but it's not quite as good as, say, OH minus. So it's in this intermediate range, and eh, I don't know what to do with that. All right, what else? All right, well, let's talk now about the Wittig reaction. This is a Nobel Prize winning reaction named after its discoverer, uh, Georg Wittig, who won the Nobel Prize in 1979, which happens to be the year of my birth. Whoa, right? Long time ago. Um, and this is a really useful reaction because you can use it for what's called convergent synthesis, where convergent synthesis where is where you can manufacture two different parts of a molecule and at a very late stage bring them together via a selective reaction. So um, the, the connection to chapter 14 is tenuous at best other than that it involves an aldehyde or a ketone. So uh, here is an aldehyde. And then you have what is called the Wittig reagent. And this is weird, and you won't have necessarily seen this before. Um, yeah, there we go. And this is called an ILID. That's the name for this kind of molecule where you have a positive and a negative charge on adjacent atoms. Uh, sometimes people will draw the ILID as its resonance structure. Um, sometimes people get uncomfortable with this resonance structure because you have, if you were sort of following along, actually five bonds to phosphorus. Five bonds is a totally fine thing for stuff that's below the second row of the periodic table. In some ways, it's just an issue of the atom itself being big enough that it can tolerate uh, that many bonds with reasonable stability. In any case, you can draw the mechanism of this reaction from either of these reagents. The big point, though, is that this reagent is, is sort of carbanion-like, it is nucleophilic at carbon, all right? So I'll show you the product of the reaction and then we'll talk about mechanism. Um, the product of the reaction is a new double bond between the carbonyl carbon and the pink carbon from your ILID. So here's your carbonyl carbon, here's the pink carbon of the ILID, and then, let's see, one, two, three. So you make a new alkene, and if there is the possibility of stereoisomers, you get both. Uh, however, yeah, and I'm not sure whether you should expect to get the more stable cis versus the trans or just draw both. Um, so yeah, we'll sort of leave it at that. If, as far as we're concerned, we'll expect to get both stereoisomers as a possibility. Okay, so um, how does this reaction work? You first draw the aldehyde or ketone and then draw the ILID or the Wittig reagent <coughs> sort of by the side of the aldehyde or ketone. And in this process, it may actually help you to draw in the hydrogens that are implied but not originally shown. All right. 
So following what we know about uh, carbonyl chemistry, it makes sense for the negative charge on the ilid to attack the carbonyl carbon, uh, uh, attack the pi star at the carbonyl carbon, that would break the pi bond. But it turns out that, as I said before, if you look, it's okay to have five bonds with phosphorus. As we break that carbon-oxygen uh, pi bond, the oxygen's going to become much more nucleophilic. And it turns out that oxygen-phosphorus bonds are pretty strong. So there's a driving force for this oxygen to attack the phosphorus. And this generates a four-membered ring intermediate. You might be worried about ring strain here, and that's okay in the sense that phosphorus is a larger atom, so bonds to phosphorus are longer. Uh, and so ring strain is not such an issue. But you end up with this, this weird sort of four-membered ring intermediate. And in this process, you can tell we've made first the sigma bond between what used to be the negatively charged carbon of our ilid and the carbonyl carbon of the aldehyde, right? And notice in our product, we've done two things. We made both a sigma and a pi bond. So we can check off the new carbon-carbon-sigma bond that we made. Oh, excuse me, sorry. Uh, my People have told me over the years that at some point my head's gonna explode if I sneeze like that. But it hasn't happened yet. Maybe on your watch it'll happen, we'll see. Gross. All right, so what happens to make the pi bond is, um, and there's not a wrong way to, to draw the arrows to this reaction. We could draw it like this, or alternatively like this. Doesn't matter, either way is fine. Uh, but basically we form a new oxygen phosphorus pi bond and a new carbon carbon pi bond that relieves ring strain and releases uh, the alkene that we made. It also generates as a byproduct triphenylphosphine oxide, uh, which is really quite stable. And uh, in some ways, forming that triphenylphosphine oxide is a driving force for the reaction. So people will use the Wittig reaction to make carbon uh, carbon sigma and pi bonds uh, at a late stage. Converting a carbonyl uh, oxygen into uh, uh, an alkene. And so you can put this on the list of carbon-carbon uh, bond forming reactions that allow you to build things that are more complicated. All right. Um, I guess I should say something about how to make the Wittig reagent. Uh, it's actually not as uh, bad as you think. So uh, in the case shown above, we would have started with the corresponding alkyl halide. We would have done an SN2 reaction with triphenylphosphine. And that generates what we would call the phosphonium salt. Phosphorus is from the same column of the periodic table as is nitrogen, and so <laughs> its chemistry is similar. Phosphonium salt, because a phosphorus bonded to four things, is uh, positively charged. Then you need a strong base to remove the proton that is adjacent to the phosphorus. And the strong base of choice is actually um, N-butyl lithium, which you've, we've seen earlier in chapter 13 as a nucleophile, only here it's going to act as a base to remove the proton, and that generates the ilid. So the Wittig reagent is, is basically like a carbanion. You have to be careful with it and um, not use like water as a solvent uh, so that the carbanion can survive. 
Okay. Um, one thing we could say about synthesis is there's often a better, there's often a good way to do a Wittig reaction, a, an effective way and a less effective way. So to illustrate this, let's start with this alkene. We know that alkenes are now products of the Wittig reaction, so we could split this sigma and pi bond into do two different parts. The question is which parts should be the aldehyde and which part should be the uh, Wittig reagent or the illid. You can think of two basic possibilities, right? One would be to have the aldehyde here or the ketone here and then to use one, two, only two carbons. And then to use this um, Wittig reagent, which you could have gotten from the corresponding primary alkyl halide. Option two would have been to try to use this aldehyde and then this cyclic illid, which you could have gotten from the corresponding secondary alkyl halide. Any sense as to which of these two approaches is the better one? Go ahead. Okay, top one nucleophile is less hindered. Okay, good. From where? Sorry, keep going. Okay, so this nucleophile is a little bit less, uh, is a little bit more hindered because it's on this, uh, it's basically on a secondary carbon. So I think, I think there's, you've got one issue which is the ease of nucleophilic attack. Probably um, this approach is better in the sense that the thing that's getting, attacky, getting attacked, even though it's a secondary carbon, that's sp2 hybridized, so it's relatively flat. Whereas over here, the thing doing the attacking is pretty sterically <coughs> hindered. The other issue to consider is just the ease of the SN2 reaction from the alkyl halide. You've got a primary alkyl halide here versus a secondary alkyl halide here. Probably the SN2 reaction to generate the phosphonium salt prior to making the illid, probably that SN2 reaction is faster. Uh, on the primary alkyl halide. So yeah, if you were gonna choose a better approach, this one is probably better due to the faster uh, SN2 reaction of the primary alkyl halide. All right, that's not too terribly hard. There's not a lot of uh, tricky issues in terms of selectivity there. Probably it's worth um, practicing some of the synthesis problems in the text related to the Wittig reaction. Um, yeah, anything you want to ask about that? Yeah. So for both the cyanohydrogen and the Wittig reaction, do you keep them for the aldehyde side? Like yes, yeah, so for either of these, I didn't say, but ketones are fine for the Wittig reaction and also for cyanohydrin. Yeah, the only difference is you'd have an R, another R group there instead of a hydrogen. Okay, what else? No? I assume that esters are not okay. Esters, not okay. I don't know, actually. It's a good question. Um, the potential problem with esters for the Wittig reaction would just be after the nucleophile attacks, then what happens? because uh, you've got a leaving group that could leave. So I don't, I don't actually know, it's a good question, but uh, it certainly wouldn't work in the same way. All right. Okay, there are other versions of the Wittig reaction that are also useful synthetically, but we'll sort of stick to that one. All right, acid-base chemistry. You remember chapter two? Good on chapter two, yeah?
can you look at a biomolecule and tell me what its formal charge is as a function of pH? Yes. Some of you have seen that question three times before. <laughs> so let's, let's go through that again and make sure we can actually do that. So chapter 15 is about carboxylic acids. There's stuff there that uh, you can look at. I'm not going to spend any time talking about the spectroscopic properties of carboxylic acids, that is how to recognize them in an NMR spectrum. You should still read that stuff because that will be useful to you uh, in uh, the 353 lab. There's a particular uh, chemical shift where carboxylic acid protons tend to show up and you ought to know where it was, where it is and be able to recognize it. Um, Right, so this is a carboxylic acid, okay? It's more acidic than an alcohol because the conjugate base is stabilized by resonance. Got that, okay? Okay, um, pKa of a regular carboxylate carboxylic acid proton is around four. If you start introducing electron withdrawing groups alpha to a carboxylic acid, that makes the corresponding proton more acidic. For example, the alpha chlorocarboxylic acid has a pKa of three instead of four. Uh, the reason for that is that you have the electron withdrawing group alpha to the carboxylic acid and that can pull away electron density from the negatively charged oxygens via what is called an inductive effect. That just means you're uh, be owing to chlorine's higher electronegativity than carbon, you're literally pulling more electron density away to the left-hand side of the molecule, which is making it less bad to have a negative charge over here. That's the inductive effect. You add more of these and you get an even larger, um, add more withdrawing groups, the pKa can get lower. Um, so there's no numbers to memorize there, but uh, being able to rationalize why uh, one pKa is lower than another is useful, and it's as simple as this inductive effect. Um, let's see. Amino acids, which we'll encounter later on in the semester, the pKa of a proton that has a nitrogen near it, as in this amino acid glycine, is around two. And again, that's because of the electron withdrawing effect of the alpha amino group. Um, another thing that's useful is to be able to rationalize differences in acidity uh, when benzene rings are involved, there's a whole field of, or a full, whole subfield of organic chemistry that's sort of interested in this. We'll get to more details uh, when we talk about aromatic rings a little bit later on. Um, if you compare these two carboxylic acids, benzoic acid, versus para-nitro-benzoic acid. This one, and I should have pKa numbers, but I don't. This one is more acidic. It's actually okay if I don't have pKa numbers. I would worry if I had them that you guys would ask if you had to memorize them, which I would say no. Do you want to? And um, All right. Para-nitro-benzoic acid is more acidic, and that has to do not so much with the electronegativity of nitrogen. Uh, the inductive effect is pretty distance dependent. You can do, if you were to extend this carboxylic acid out and put the chloro at the beta carbon or the gamma carbon, 
the effect of that uh, electron withdrawing group would tail off the further you get it away from the carbon. Um, so this nitrogen is actually pretty far from the carbonyl carbon. Uh, so let me show you what's going on here. If you actually draw out the Lewis structure of the nitro group, then you can see how it becomes possible to draw a resonance structure in which you move electrons from the ring out onto the nitro group. Some of you are now about to encounter another question you may have gotten wrong more than once. Here is, I don't like that color, let's try something else. All right, so by resonance we can put a positive charge into this ring. What other carbons in the ring can share that positive charge? Ah. <laughs> Right air? <laughs> Which ones? One and three, good. And you can show that if you want to by the resonance positive charge two step or one step actually whereby we move a pi bond over and then the carbon that was originally involved in that, that pi bond now has, sorry, messing up, now has a positive charge. Sorry, I messed up. There, was, there should always be a positive formal charge on the nitrogen the way we've drawn things. Okay. And then, similarly, I mean, fine. We'll draw it out. Okay, so that positive charge we've demonstrated uh, that was on, you can withdraw electron density from the ring into the nitro group. This is, uh, the nitro group is called, uh, and we'll encounter this later in the class, we're gonna call this an electron withdrawing group, EWG, via resonance. It makes the ring more electron poor now, what has that got to do with the carboxylic acid? Why should that make this proton more acidic? Go ahead. It can pull more of the negative charge into it. Yep, if you have that positive charge on the ring, then yes, in the conjugate base of your carboxylic acid, you've got this large group nearby that is electron poor and is going to pull electron density in away from the carboxylate. So this is actually a pretty complicated explanation. Is, uh, is what's going on here resonance or is it an inductive effect? And the answer is yes, it's resonance that withdraws electron density from the ring. But notice that um, in this conjugate base, there's no there's no way we can um, move electrons from either of the oxygens into the ring. They're not connected that way. There's no way you can push arrows to make that happen. And therefore, uh, if you compare resonance stabilization of benzoic acid, the conjugate base of benzoic acid versus resonance stabilization of the conjugate base of para nitrobenzoic acid, they, they both are gonna have the 
negative charge delocalized on those two carbons. There's no difference there. The difference is in what's going on with the ring, and the benzene ring is electron poor in paranitrobenzoic acid. It's electron poor because of resonance, but not, it doesn't involve delocalization of the, uh, resonance delocalization of the negative charge on the oxygens, okay? So it's a combination of resonance electron withdrawing effect that makes the ring electron poor, then an inductive effect whereby the ring pulls electron density away through the bonds from the carboxylic acid, All right? So you can have um, some fun actually trying a bunch of other groups other than nitro and seeing, you know, what would you predict? Should the, should the pKa of the carboxylic acid be greater or smaller? We'll come back to that sort of as a way of ranking how powerful electron withdrawing groups are. All right, any questions you want to ask about benzoic acid? Yeah. Ah, so yeah, that's an interesting question. We need to look up numbers here, actually, because I'm not sure. <laughs> um, So you want to Google what is the pKa of para hydroxy uh, para let's do paramethoxy let's get rid of another proton paramethoxy benzoic acid while you're at it somebody look up the pKa of para nitrobenzoic acid and while somebody else is at it let's do let's just do benzoic acid so we have numbers all around to make comparisons to I'm asking you to do that because your thumbs are faster than mine at texting. I, tech, uh, stupid autocorrect. I just say the AI predictor is terrible at knowing what I want to say. What do you got? Yeah, go ahead. Um, Paramethoxy benzoic acid is what? 4.47. Okay, what else? What else have we got? Benzoic acid about five, and then 3.4 something. Okay. Um, bu 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 good. All right. Yeah. So this is this is pretty interesting. Paramethoxy benzoic acid is more acidic than benzoic acid, but not as acidic as nitro. However, oxygen's more, electric, uh, oxygen's more electronegative than nitrogen, so what's going on? Something about a positive, say, say it louder, I said something about a positive charge. Okay, oxygen can't bear a positive charge as well as nitrogen can because it's more electronegative. That's good. Um, if you compare the nitro group to the methoxy group, is there anywhere in the methoxy group for electron density from the ring to go? No. In fact, nitro follows a pattern of, uh, of electron withdrawing groups in general, and that is, you know, if this is the benzene ring over here, an electron withdrawing group is gonna have some atom here that is, a resonance electron withdrawing group is gonna have some atom X that is doubly bonded to an electronegative heteroatom. If you have that situation, then you're always gonna be able to take one of the pi bonds from the ring and do resonance to move electron density outside the ring. There's some place for the electrons to go. That's not true for the methoxy group. You just, where would you, I mean, just try, right? Where are the electrons gonna go? You've suddenly just made five bonds to oxygen, right? So uh, methoxy is not an electron withdrawing group via resonance. 
Um, it, is, it is an electron withdrawing group via an inductive effect. But remember that I told you that that inductive effect is highly distance dependent. It tails off the further away you get from the acid, right? So uh, that's why the methoxy group is a little bit less acidic than benzoic acid, but not by a huge amount. Um, for fun, <laughs> later on, when we start talking about doing reactions with benzene rings, we will learn that groups like methoxy, heteroatoms with lone pairs on them adjacent to the benzene ring can actually be electron donating groups via resonance. That is, you can do the resonance negative charge two-step to delocalize lone pairs from the oxygen into the ring. Another test question, very a version of one you've seen before, which atoms share the negative charge? Yeah. Same thing, right? Um, and there needs to be a positive charge on that oxygen. Now, my question to you is, uh, and this, what I've, what I've drawn here is the ability of methoxy to be an electron donating group via resonance. How big of an effect is this? What would you, if this were a major effect for benzoic acid, what would you predict would happen based on having an electron rich benzene ring adjacent to the acid? What should that do to the pKa? Go ahead. You think it would go higher, right? Be less acidic. And um, the fact that it's not as, uh, it's not higher or not less acidic than benzoic acid tells you that for methoxy, you've got a trade off of two things. You've got the electron donating ability of the oxygen by resonance set against its electron withdrawing ability because of, an, because of electronegativity, right? And so those two things almost offset each other entirely for benzoic acid. We will see other contexts in which the electron donating effect matters. Um, it will have to do with reactivity in, in kinetics more than it has to do with, say, pKa issues. But just I want you to be aware of all of these things um, as, we, as we move on uh, in the class. The most important thing, though, is not memorizing pKa numbers, but being able to rationalize data based on reasonable arguments, okay? So for the nitro group, the electron withdrawing ability of the nitro group made the benzene ring electron poor enough that uh, it became a good, uh, we were able to withdraw electron density from the carboxylic acid uh, because of the electron poor benzene ring immediately next door. Combination of resonance electron withdrawing here to make the ring electron poor and then inductive electron withdrawing here that sucks electron density away from the carboxylic acid through the sigma bonds. Uh, for the paramethoxy benzoic acid, the, the explanation for why the pKa is lower than that of benzoic acid must be because of electron withdrawing via an inductive effect because of the electronegativity of this oxygen. And that effect must be more important for benzoic acid than the ability of the methoxy to act as an electron donor. Go ahead. Is it? Yeah. Oh. Man. Okay. So now we just now we need multiple sources and we need to average them, right? Because who knows, right? Uh, let's see. We could go to your text. You don't trust the text anymore. Ah. Let me show you the definitive source for PKAs, shall I? You don't, you don't really care, you don't want to memorize them. Um, 
So Professor Hans Reich at the University of Wisconsin was, was there when I was getting my PhD. He knew everything there was to know about NMR, and he actually used NMR to study the structure of organolithium reagents. Um, he died tragically a couple years ago, and the American Chemical Society took over the website he had um, maintained for decades uh, about pKa values. So I'm just going to Google Hans Reich pKa table, and that takes you to here. And let's see, we probably want to see pKa's in water. Anything, right, pages upon pages of, of pKa values. So you can select them by, whoop, whoop, da, da, da. let's just go in water. Stop me when you see benzoic acids. I know about control F, Hunter. I'm just <laughs> <laughs> All right, well that's a definitive source, but apparently you can't find anything because there's so much. All right, well, dang. Um, Let's just do pKa's of substituted benzoic acids. Okay, free open access text. Might be a little suspicious, but. Okay, so we got 4.2. But you know, five is the same as 4.2 with to, at, at zero significant figures, so that's probably what they were doing. Um, okay, here we got some numbers. Uh, they don't have nitro, but they do have, okay, so we were right on for methoxy. Right, okay. So that makes our story a little bit more convenient um, with some data. Now it looks, Let's see, it was 4.2 here. So yeah, the methoxy group is a little bit, just a little bit less acidic, right? And so, but the, the, the answer though is the same. You see the offsetting things going on here with methoxy. You've got the electron withdrawing effect because of uh, electronegativity. That's the one where oxygen is more electronegative than carbon, so it tends to pull electron density through the sigma bonds out of the ring. And then you've got the ability to donate via resonance that tends to make the ring more electron rich. Those two effects are offsetting and just barely, it looks like, barely the donating effect wins in such a way that when you've got the methoxy group here, this proton is even less acidic than it is for benzoic acid. All right, interesting story. Okay, clearly knowing the numbers memorized is not important because I didn't, right? But being able to rationalize the numbers based on uh, structure of the molecules is. Anything you want to ask about that? Clarify? Yeah? I'm sorry, I still don't quite understand why um, less acidic. What about benzoic acid makes that more Benzoic acid lacks the electron donating group. Okay, so let's just put it this way. Um, based on the fact that the, okay, conjugate base of benzoic acid has a negative charge on the carboxylate group. So, and the benzene ring is adjacent to the carboxylate group. So in general, you would predict that if the ring becomes electron rich, the benzoic acid should be less acidic because the conjugate base is less stable. Does that make sense? In, or if the benzoic acid were more electron poor, you should be more acidic. I can't uh, spell at all, right? More acidic because the conjugate base would be more stable. 
So things that make the benzene ring electron poor are going to make it more acidic. Things that make it electron rich are going to make it less acidic. Nitro makes it very much electron poor. For nitro, you have parallel alignment of two effects. First, nitrogen's electronegative. Second, an electron withdrawing group by resonance. In contrast, for methoxy, you have two opposing effects, donating by resonance, withdrawing by electronegativity. And it must be the data tell you that the donating group wins in terms of the overall acidity. The, the, the ring is a little bit more electron rich. Yep. Yes. Ah, boy, let's see. Okay, um, we need a court recorder. Can you read back the, no. Um, don't, uh, things that make the benzene ring in, a, in, in substituted benzoic acids, things that make the ring more electron rich should destabilize the negatively charged conjugate base and therefore make the acid less acidic. Things that make the ring electron poor should make the acid stronger because they'll stabilize the conjugate base. For the nitro group, you have uh, alignment of two things. Nitrogen's more electronegative than carbon. Also, the nitro group is a withdrawing group by resonance. Those two things make the, electron, make the benzene ring more electron poor in, in nitrobenzoic acid than in ben regular benzoic acid, and therefore, nitrobenzoic acid's more acidic. Uh, in contrast, with the methoxy group, you have two opposing effects. Oxygen's more electronegative than carbon, so through the sigma bonds at least, we should be pulling electron density out of the ring, but those lone pairs on the oxygen can donate electron density back into the ring by resonance. Those are two opposing effects, and apparently the pKa data tell you that the, do the thing that ends up happening is uh, uh, the methoxybenzoic acid's less acidic, and it must be because the donating effect is powerful enough to overwhelm the withdrawing effect. Yeah? Is the donating effect similar to withdrawing that it's just independent, so the closer the donating group is, the less acidic? It's, it's a good question. Is the donating effect as distance dependent? And the answer is no, because resonance is more of a long range thing. Resonance does tail off after a while, but not as fast as the inductive effect does. A good way to test that uh, hypothesis, and I don't know what the answer is, but that would be to try uh, orthomethoxy benzoic acid. Then you have, again, remember, methoxy is an electron withdrawing group by an inductive effect but it is an electron donating group by resonance, you would expect perhaps, I would predict that putting the methoxy group closer to the benzoic acid would strengthen the inductive effect, but perhaps not change the withdrawing effect that, or I'm sorry, would strengthen the withdrawing inductive effect, but not the donating resonance effect as much. So if I were gonna predict, I mean, we can look up the numbers, but I might predict this to be, uh, more acidic than the para version. Let's see. What? Yes! <laughs> Looked it up. Did you just make that up to make me feel good? Come on, be honest. You use the, you use the Hans Reich website? Okay, we trust Hans Reich. 4.09. So yeah, the, it, it looks like there you're strengthening the inductive effect by getting the group closer. Right, highly distance dependent, resonance not as much, at least, yeah, um, at least the, in the range of a benzene ring. What's that? It's fun to see that with the nitro, because where the nitro is right now is the 3.44. Okay. But ortho is the 3.14. Yeah. So it's like it's not that much of a difference. Ooh. Yeah. So what was I missing? What was it? Was there something? I do, on there, there's a search bar. <sighs> It's a search bar, come on, where? Where is the search bar? Uh, okay, do you feel like you're talking to your grandparents? Okay. It's right there. See, see? Now I control F, okay. Ah, there it is. <laughs> Look at that, all the data we could, we could ever imagine. Um, ortho, meta, and para. Nice, okay. So yeah, isn't that interesting? You get the, uh, 
you get the nitro group, now I forgot the number, it was like 2.17 or something like that. Close enough, you've got both the withdrawing group, you've, you've got both, uh, sorry, resonance and inductive thing, things going on. My guess is that the increase is mostly because the electronegative oxygen's closer, nitrogen's closer. My guess is it's not so much resonance Proximity shouldn't affect resonance as much, at least not on this scale. Yeah. All right, well, that was fun. Um, let's go ahead and take five or so, and then when we come back, we will talk about the horrible, horrible problem of pH dependence of protonation state. It's always fun. <laughs> All right, well. Let's get back into it. So, many of you have seen um, now presumably in your nightmares a large molecule with lots of functional groups on it. And somebody asking you to say what the net charge on this thing or the formal charge should be as a function of pH. I'm just drawing a bunch of groups that are common in um, side chains of proteins, but it doesn't necessarily need to be a protein. Ooh, phosphoprotein, shall we do that? And usually the jerk that wrote this question um, drew it for you in the neutral form. I'll just get rid of that. So you have to sort of work your way through and try to figure out as a function of pH whether certain groups should be positively charged versus negatively charged. Um, there's a couple of different ways you can approach this problem, but uh, one of the first ones is to realize that uh, among the acids that, and bases that you have encountered, there are some neutral acids that have negatively charged conjugate bases. This is... Uh, So this is HA and A minus. However, there are also positively charged or cationic acids with neutral conjugate bases. So um, you might draw it that way. Uh, and some groups have both kinds of things going on at once. Uh, as an example of a neutral acid that has a negatively charged conjugate base is HCl, right? That's boring. Um, how about something that is a cationic acid that has a neutral conjugate base? Well, the ammonium ions fall in this category. Positively charged ammonium, neutral amine. But um, the neutral amine is itself an acid that has a negatively charged conjugate base. The pKa going from a cationic amine, ammonium ion, to neutral amine is uh, sort of depends on a lot of things. For regular ammonium, it's around nine. If we substitute one of these protons with an R group, it would be around 11. Uh, that distinction would be provided for you on a pKa table. And uh, in contrast, going from the neutral amine to the uh, negatively charged amide, that process has a pKa of 38. 
They're not the same. And you can see how if you got mixed up and chose the wrong number, you could get an entirely wrong conclusion. And I think in my experience, most students uh, that struggle with questions like this forget to even worry about this one because they'll see a molecule and they'll be able to clearly identify the amino functional group. They'll go right to their table. They'll say that has a PK of 38 and they'll make judgments based on that. Uh, forgetting that the neutral amine could also be protonated to become a positively charged ammonium group. Am I making that horrible and confusing enough? Go ahead. Right. If the pH were 7, it would be in the ammonium form. Right. Yeah. So uh, let, and we'll, we'll talk about that in just, in just a second. Um, in some ways, the reason this is a problem is because when you were in general chemistry, the problems were often formulated like this. Um, Bill wants to make a buffer, and so he mixes monosodium phosphate with disodium phosphate in what ratio in order to get a pH of 7? And there's an equation you use and it's just plug and chug and you get there. But the idea is what you do in that case, in, the, in that, that problem, the idea was what you dissolve in solution determines the pH of the solution. Which is great. That is a useful, context, uh, that is a useful problem if you are a lab tech making buffers for people. Um, but if you're doing biology, the pH of blood and cytoplasm and serum is set for you by the buffer, and that pH affects the rest of the molecules that are dissolved in that buffer. Frankly, it's an issue of concentration. When you're in a buffered solution, the, the concentration of buffer is, is uh, around uh, you know, anywhere from 100 to 150 millimolar. Milla is 10 to the minus 7, so 0.1 molar. Whereas the concentration of a lot of biomolecules in important uh, contexts is on the order of, we'll just say, micromolar and below range. Okay? So, if your biomolecule is present in a much lower concentration than your buffer, it stands to reason the pH controlled by the buffer should affect the biomolecule and not the other way around. See, some of you are approaching this problem trying to think, okay, I, I throw this molecule in water, then what happens? And the answer is you throw the molecule in buffered solution, the pH of the buffer determines what gets protonated and what doesn't. Some of you were looking at this and say, how can that be positively charged? You threw it in neutral. Where did the proton come from? And I'm telling you from the 150 mol millimolar buffer that's around. Okay, 150 millimolar buffer means you've got plenty of H3O plus and OH minus to do the deprotonating and the pH is going to control whether that happens or not. Do I need to try, try again? I feel like that, that, that didn't necessarily explain clearly sort of got it okay some of you uh, think in math in, instead and you, there is a way to uh, come to this conclusion via maths um, kind of fun you don't um, <laughs> the question that I'm anticipating is do we have to know this for the test the answer is everything I say is important so yes but on a multiple choice test are you going to need to be deriving things? No. Certainly won't, I mean, so if math doesn't help you, if words help you instead of math, then just put, put your brain on pause for the moment. But I'm gonna show for you where we get an equation that allows you to determine as a function of pH whether the conjugate base or acid form should dominate. So acid base equilibrium, here is the equilibrium expression. Some of you are going to say, hold on, they told us in general chemistry 
that the activity of a pure substance is one and therefore you drop water from the equilibrium expression. I'm telling you wrong or at least um, wrong from a certain point of view. So uh, we're going to continue to put concentrations in here and uh, we'll just make the general chemists mad. Um, all right, so that's your equilibrium expression. Um, the concentration of water in uh, a, an aqueous solution is around 55 molar. That means it's more concentrated than anything else in solution. That means that no matter what the state of this equilibrium, the concentration of water stays the same. So we can actually move that over to this side of the equation. And then that uh, equilibrium constant times water concentration equals the what you've talked about as the acid dissociation constant ka before by the way acids don't dissociate in water there's no such thing as h plus in water what what is that blasphemy to you people yes <laughs> Acid dissociation does not happen in water. What happens in water is the following. Period. Full stop. Right. <laughs> right. So um, even though you have been maybe thinking about acid-base chemistry as being HA goes to H plus and A minus. That was just shorthand for what's actually happening in water. So uh, let's fix that particular misconception, all right? Anyway, that's your acid dissociation constant. Now, uh, these Ka numbers, you can measure them. You can measure this equilibrium constant for a particular acid versus water, see which side dominates, and uh, you can tabulate these Ka values, but they vary over tens of orders of magnitude, and because we want to avoid unnecessary scientific notation, we'll just uh, use logarithms to make things a little bit more simple. So we're gonna define a new term PKA, an old term because you've seen it before. P stands for power, as in power of 10. I didn't know that until just recently. Minus log of KA equals the minus log of this stuff. Then you can use properties of logarithms, kind of cute, to separate out a couple of terms. Minus log of H3O plus is just pH. So you can put pH there, and then let's see, what are we left with? The minus log of concentration of A minus over HA. So what we've got here is an equation, whoa, two equal signs, that's, I wonder what that means. Uh, got an equation with three things, pKa, pH, and ratio between conjugate base and acid, right? Yes? Addition sign between where? Yeah, you, you can, but you gotta flip what's in the, yeah, you may have seen this in other forms. It's uh, totally fine, pH plus log of <coughs> HA over A minus. Yep, just properties of logarithms, okay. So you can adjust this um, however you want. A particularly useful form is pKa minus pH equals the log of conjugate acid over, or sorry, acid over base, conjugate base. Okay, what do you know about logarithms? If HA is equal to A minus, the log of one is zero, right? So if uh, acid and its conjugate base are present in equal amounts, the log is zero. If this number is greater than one, the log is positive. If this number is less than one, but greater than zero, the log is negative, right? Okay, in other words, the difference between pKa and pH tells you what this number in here has to be. So, if pKa 
Now here, now we're back to words. Uh, for those of you that don't want maths, if you want words, pKa, if pKa is greater than pH, then HA concentration must be greater than A minus. In other words, if your pH is lower than the pKa of your acid, the acid still has its proton. So maybe let's actually reframe this because pKa is going to stay constant. pH is what's going to change. If pH is less than pKa, then this number on the left-hand side is positive, which means this number is greater than 1. Therefore, acid form dominates. If pH is greater than pKa, then conjugate base form dominates. Yes, pH is of the solution, yep. And, and in general, that's going to be set by the buffer or whatever experimental conditions that you're using. Or by which organelle you're in. If you're in the lysosome, the pH is low, 5 or 2 or whatever it is. If you're in cytoplasm, the pH is like 7. Okay. Yeah? So is this why you are Right. Yes, in biochemistry, uh, the R groups, the side chains, ha to the extent that they have groups uh, that are what they call ionizable, that is groups that either can lose a proton or gain a proton, yes, the pH will affect whether that group is charged or not, and that has an impact on protein folding, yes. Okay. So, now we're prepared to answer this question. It's useful, um, you're going to get to the point where you've got this in your sleep, um, and it won't be a bad nightmare anymore. <laughs> so, uh, but before then, what is useful to do is go through and identify each group that is either a neutral acid that could lead to a negatively charged conjugate base, or a neutral base that could be protonated to form a positively charged conjugate acid. This neutral amine could lose a proton to form the negatively charged RNH minus, and that pKa would be 38. Or the neutral amine could be protonated uh, to, from, uh, to give the positively charged ammonium ion, and that pKa is 11. I happen to have that in my head because I've explained this problem to so many people over the years. You don't have to have that memorized. It's in a table. You better be able to know how to look stuff up in a table, though. Uh, a classic mistake in looking stuff up at the table is not using the correct pKa. Right? Um, 11 refers to ammonium to neutral amine. 38 refers to neutral amine to negatively charged amide. Um, carboxylic acid going to neutral, or sorry, neutral carboxylic acid going to negatively charged carboxylate, that's four for, a, for that particular carboxylic acid. Neutral thiol going to negatively charged thiolate, that's eight as a pKa. Carboxylic acid, oh, we, just, we don't want to do that one, let's just erase it. Um, <laughs> phenol going to phenylate, yeah, just erasing stuff and changing the problem. Unfortunately, it's not an option for you on the exam. Yeah, pKa around 10. Um, this group is not, uh, this is a functional group called the guanid guanidine functional group. It is uh, not an amino group. You would be able to find it on a table that I would give you. And in general, on a table, you want to find the thing that's closest as possible to the structure that's shown. Um, I don't actually know what the pKa is going from a neutral guanidine to its negatively charged conjugate base. I do, however, know the pKa of the positively charged guanidinium conjugate acid, and that pKa is 12. All right. Um, questions about identifying the appropriate PKAs? 
uh, phosphoric acid. This is actually called, this functional group is called a phosphoester. Um, it has multiple protons. The first one's pKa is around two, and the second is around seven. Okay, so now, uh, as a function of pH, we can say what the protonation state of this molecule should be. So we're going to use the color orange for uh, uh, pH two. Uh, actually, let's just make things really easy and say pH one. All right, so now for each of these, we need to select what the protonation state of a side chain should be as a function of pH. Again, you're going to go back to your words or your equations. Um, isn't that, have you ever had the moment where something's just not coming to you? You're trying to explain something to somebody and you pause and then somebody, some jerk says, use your words. Use your words we used to say to our little children when they were frustrated and yelling and it was condescending then, it's condescending now too. So anyway, um, yeah, what is your, so either use your equations or your words to <laughs> figure out. For the amino group at pH one, what is the appropriate protonation state? Negative, neutral, or positive? Positive, positive. that is because one is less than 11. Oh, okay, right. So, right, at neutral, uh, sorry, at pH one, we expect this group to be positively charged. So, okay, we got, and I'm drawing it in orange because that's the state at pH one. Carboxylic acid, pH one, neutral, because one is less than four, which means the acid form dominates. So, we'll just put a zero there. Thiol. One is less than eight, so that proton is still on. Phosphoester, neutral, because that proton should still be on and that one should still be on. Zero or one is less than two, which is also, one is also less than seven. So, okay, zero. Um, what else we got? Same reason there. How about here, guanidinium versus guanidine? One is less than 12, so positive. Overall at pH one, net charge equals plus two. Usually on these problems you have options, you know, thank the testing center, the bubble sheet has options A through like K, so you've got all kinds of choices, yeah. A pKa threshold to know whether something can be protonated to form a positive charge? What do you mean? Yeah, the threshold is this number. It's oh, how do you know which groups can gain a proton? Um, in general, look at the pKa table, but notice that um, the amine has a lone pair on it. So actually, so does the sulfur. What's the pKa of the positively charged sulfonium ion? I don't actually know. Presumably it's pretty low. Um, for water, uh, the positively charged hydronium or oxonium ion has a pKa of minus two. We generally don't worry about it because we're not looking at pHs in minus two, in the minus two range in general. Yeah. All right, what else? Yeah. So I'm, I'm just wondering here. Um, so you said you use the PKs in the values. Um, you're just saying that when you were at the pH value, you were saying about half of the molecule was protonated, half of it was unprotonated, and then you just were still just looking at the result. If pH is equal to pKa according to what we've formulated here, then yes, conjugate base and acid are evenly matched. What do you do then? Naturally, I choose the pHs so as to avoid that situation because then what are you going to do? 
In other words, uh, if I tell you the pH is 7, some of you are going to be like, well, it's 50-50 here. What do I do there for answering the question? I'm like, you're right. So I'm not going to choose. I'm going to choose pHs that make it possible to make a clear distinction. Yeah, go ahead. Yep. If you could make, oh, yes, if you, yeah, you dissolve a neutral amine in yeah. buffered water and the pH is buffered at seven, then yeah, it's gonna be in the ammonium form. Where's it gonna get that proton? From either protonated buffer molecules or from hydronium. Yeah. Uh, so for the group that has the phosphorus, and if pH was eight, it would go down to a minus two? If pH was eight, it would be minus two. Right. Yep. PH was six, it would be minus one. Okay, others? Um, so let me just tell you why this is important or why I care about it. Um, I'm gonna write out, no, should I? Yeah. Maybe. No, I don't want to anymore. Um, so some of my dissertation research was on um, a kind of protein structure called a coiled coil where you have one alpha helix that wraps around another alpha helix in sort of a twisted pattern. This is called a leucine zipper sometimes if you, if you have taken or will take biochemistry. Um, some coil coils form what are called homodimers where the same uh, helix will meet another copy of itself and they will pack against each other to form a homodimeric coil coil. Others form heterodimers where two different molecules, different sequences, dimerize to form this leucine zipper or coil coil. One of the ways you can control this, if we were to um, sort of do the whole Newman projection thing and look down the helical axis, um, what we would see is sort of one spiraling helix uh, packing against another and you can control that's terrible isn't it because it, it doesn't actually look like that anyway um, <laughs> at the coil at the interface between helices you have nonpolar functional groups the hydrophobic effect promotes the uh, placement of these nonpolar functional groups at the interface between helices where they can be sequestered from water. Usually at uh, flanking the interface, you have protein side chains that are positive, can be positively charged or negatively charged. And um, if you, you can control for hetero versus homo association with these charged groups. Uh, at pH seven, we should have a positively charged ammonium here and a negatively charged carboxylate if you believe the pKa's that I showed you above. And you can see how it would be more favorable to have complementary charged interactions across the surface of this helix assembly versus having like charge oops nope not that you can see that if if this um, single helix tried to dimerize you would still bury nonpolar surface area but you'd have charge charge repulsion across the interface between the helices. And that repulsion destabilizes the homodimer 
versus the complementary charge interactions in the heterodimer. So that's just one example of the importance of charge in controlling protein secondary, tertiary, and quaternary structure, um, which is, anyway, one of the reasons why I'm pushing you to be able to think about acid-base chemistry in this way, because this, this is the most important way to think about it for biochemical types of situations. All right, anything you want to ask about that? Please make it stop. <laughs> Please make it stop. Um, so a lot of stuff we do in my research actually ha involves interactions between charged side chains at various positions in proteins. Um, and I mean, it, it's, it's going to get worse. The amino acids uh, are often abbreviated with a one letter code. I'm, I'm writing out the sequence of at least one portion of one of these peptides now. Um, and I, my students need to be able to look at that and say, oh, those three Ks, those are lysine groups. Those are these ammonium side chains and they're positively charged. And one of my pet peeves is sitting in somebody's thesis defense somewhere where they know the sequence of a protein, but they can't tell me for the life of me whether which group should be charged versus, versus not. The reason I care about that is because as an organic chemist, as a chemist, the, the thing that differentiates chemists from biologists is chemists care about what the atoms are doing. And so anyway, I've just gone on a rant and I'm sorry. <clears throat> Nevertheless, you're gonna to have to accommodate my rant because I can guarantee now you will find something like this on a future exam where you will have to assign what the, what the formal charge is as a function of pH. It's gonna involve a lot of groups on it. There's gonna be one right answer and, um, and I'm not gonna assign partial credit, so. But I was almost right. I said the charge was plus one and it was actually plus two. And I will say, I don't care. <laughs> uh, I am a jerk, but at least I have warned you, right? <laughs> Questions? Yeah. You'll be given a PKA table, yeah. Yep, good. What else? Yeah. Right, so for a phosphoester, the table would likely do something like this. Um, So by inference, you would say, well, this 7.2 can only mean the proton that's still there. So this two must refer to the first one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, is there a PKA table on learning suite complementary? Do you want, you would like to see the PKA table that has been present on previous exams? Sure, I can make that happen. Yep. All right, okay. <clears throat> um, I think that's, that's sort of good enough on uh, chapter 15. What we're gonna do now is start it on 16, which I know you're not prepared for, but you'll thank me because if we do it, if we start it into it now, we'll have a little bit more time to get done what we need to next time. So um, the theme in chapter 16 is uh, chemistry of carboxylic acid derivatives. And you'll recall that carboxylic acid derivatives differ from ketones and aldehydes in the identity of this Y group. You recall that for ketones, the Y group is um, some hydrocarbon. Whereas for aldehydes, the Y group is a proton. For the carboxylic acid derivatives, 
the Y group is something that is or could be a leaving group. In general, the hydrocarbon uh, R minus or H minus are not going to be leaving groups ever. For the carboxylic acid derivatives, if Y equals OH, it's just a carboxylic acid. If it's OR, that's an ester. If it's CL, it's an acid chloride. Uh, what am I missing? If it's a carboxylate, you've got yourself an anhydride. We don't talk a lot about these because they're a little bit structurally complicated, but they're on the list. If it's a thiolate group, we have, instead of an ester, you have a thioester. Um, what am I missing? If it's an NH2 or an NHR, that's an amid, NH2 or, yeah. And then, <clears throat> sorry, if it's a phosphate group, Then you have what's called an acyl phosphate. We won't uh, worry about those in synthesis, but they are important in biochemistry. And when we get to um, when we get to metabolism, we'll we'll come back to these. All right. So if you look at this list of compounds. Some of these have good leaving groups on them, and some of them don't. If we were to rank them in order of leaving group ability, um, we would probably put if we were to rank them in leaving group ability. Um, we could do so simply by thinking about all of these leaving groups as what they would be after they had left or had gone. And um, we can sort of compare their leaving group ability by thinking about what the conjugate acid is and what the relevant pKa is, right? For OH minus, the conjugate acid is water, pKa of 16. OR minus, the conjugate acid is an alcohol, pKa of 16. CL minus, conjugate acid is HCl, pKa minus 7. Carboxylate, conjugate acid is the carboxylic acid, pKa 4. Thiolate, the conjugate acid is thiol, pKa 8. Uh, a, me, a, a negatively charged NH2 or R NH minus, the conjugate acids are as follows, pKa 9 or 11. Um, let's see, and then for the, pho the phosphate group, the pKa is 7 to get you to the um, singly charged conjugate acid. So you can rank these carboxylic acid derivatives in reactivity based on how good the leaving group is. I'm going to actually pull the carboxylic acid group out of this comparison because it's different than the carboxylic acid derivatives. It's got an acidic proton. The chemistry of the carboxylic acid derivative, the carboxylic acid is really going to be defined uh, by the presence of that proton. But for the other carboxylic acid derivatives, the chemistry is defined by the identity of the leaving group. And you can rank these in reactivity based on how good the leaving group is, right? So as an example, uh, if we want to rank these, it would be easy to choose the acid chloride as the most reactive. Why? Because it's got the best leaving group on it, right? 
after that one, you probably would pick the anhydride. Uh, it's got a not as good leaving group as the chloride, but still decent. Okay. Uh, next, you would probably choose uh, the acyl phosphate. And, oops, now I'm running out of space and going to put stuff in strange. Oops, we lost an oxygen somewhere. Strictly based on PKA, yeah, and it works. So probably we would choose the acyl phosphate. Um, probably next we would choose, oh, I made a horrible error. We'll come back to that. Do you know what my horrible error was? That is not the number for going from a neutral amine to the negatively charged conjugate base. That is 38. <coughs> Correct your notes. And minus, I don't know, I should have to do push-ups or something. <laughs> Not in front of you, that would be embarrassing. Okay, yeah. Oh, I, I'll tell you what, that's a penalty job. In my house, the, uh, <laughs> isn't that evil? In our family, the uh, disciplinary method of choice is penalty job. Um, you have to do extra chores if you do something <laughs> if you do something wrong. The threshold for getting a penalty job changes. For example, yesterday, um, Dallin, the 15-year-old, was beating up on um, Adam, the 11-year-old, and. Uh, but Adam had enough and then socked Dallin in the mouth and made him bleed. At that point, Dallin had successfully drawn the foul because if you draw blood, you get a penalty job. And whereupon Adam said, what? He totally provoked me. And so they're like, okay, fine, Dallin can have a penalty job too. See, the winner here is me because I get free chores no matter what. <laughs> um, and sometimes they're like, well, when I do something wrong and I apologize, they're like, Dad, you should have to do a penalty job. And I say, my whole life is a penalty job. I do penalty <laughs> jobs constantly. <laughs> um, anyway, so yes, I will do a penalty job, okay? I will clean my office when I get back up there. Um, you know, clean, take out the trash, vacuum something, it's penance, and then you get to move on with your life. There was one day, <laughs> I'm sorry, um, we don't have time for this, but we we're going to do it anyway. Um, there was one day Dallin was learning to, well, some of our children, as they've learned to be potty trained, have been reluctant to wipe themselves. This is recording. I'm going to edit this part out, I think. But, um, so there was one day Dallin, who was now 15, I think he was four or five at the time, just was sitting on the toilet saying, Mom, wipe me. And she's like, I'm not going to wipe you. You can wipe yourself. Mom, and they had this battle of wills, and she said, fine, every time you say mom, I'm going to give you a penalty job. And um, Nate, who at that point was, uh, let's see, doing math, he must use some kind of teenager, is like gleefully sitting in his room counting the number of times that Adam says, or Dallin says mom. By the end of that experience, Dallin had accrued like 200 penalty jobs, <laughs> which we think he still probably hasn't done, but... Um, <laughs> Yeah, anyway. <laughs> now my children tease me as being too quick to give out penalty jobs. Dad, I stubbed my toe, or Dad, I skinned my knee. Penalty job. <laughs> it's really not that bad. And honestly, if you would just empty the dishwasher and get the penalty job over with, you could move on with your life, right? <sighs> Somehow this seems to not be about chemistry anymore. So <laughs> let's pull it back together for a couple minutes at least. Yeah, so we had the wrong number for amides. The thioesters would probably be next, then the esters, then the amides. Now, do you see why the amide is so much more stable than the ester? Why is the amide so much more stable than the ester? Because it's got a cruddy, cruddy, cruddy leaving group on it, right? Um, do you see now why biology has chosen to make proteins as polyamides, where the linkage between individual amino acids is the amide bond rather than an ester bond? Esters are easier to hydrolyze than amides. Okay. All right, 
So um, this gives you an idea of reactivity. When biology wants a reactive carboxylic acid derivative, it will not choose the acid chloride or the anhydride because those are too reactive. That would start poisoning you. Uh, instead, it uses acyl phosphates and thioesters. <clears throat> we will see these again and again when we come to metabolism. Uh, for now, in chapter 16, when we want a really reactive carboxylic acid derivative, we're going to use the acid chloride. Uh, when we want something that's relatively stable, uh, we'll use an ester. Um, converting acid chlorides and anhydrides to other things is trivial. It's boring. So as an example, you can think of, we're going to, you know, bust through this, five different reactions whereby we can convert an acid chloride into something. All you have to do is produce the nucleophile. You produce OH minus, you're going to make the carboxylic acid. Why? Because OH minus will attack the carbonyl carbon, you'll get the tetrahedral intermediate, you'll be at that stage asking what happens next, who's the good leaving group, Cl minus is the better leaving group, and you make the carboxylic acid. Please do not memorize, there are things you need to memorize. Memorization is an appropriate tool for things like uh, does a cuprate, uh, what does a cuprate do, or lithium aluminum hydride can't stop at the aldehyde. Uh, memorization is a great tool for the appropriate job, but it isn't the right tool for this situation because you don't need it. If you understand carbonyl chemistry, it follows from basic principles that you should get the carboxylic acid by uh, uh, reacting the acid chloride with hydroxide. Similarly, if you use an alkoxide, you would make an ester. Similarly, if you used a carboxylate, you would make and anhydride. See where we're going with this? You choose the nucleophile and match the nucleophile to what you want the product to be. Use the acid chloride and you're doing what is called nucleophilic acyl substitution. What I uh, say here for acid chlorides applies for the anhydrides. I haven't drawn making an amide from an acid chloride, that would work. I haven't drawn making an thioester from an acid chloride, that would also work. Yeah? So how do you make acid chlorides? Ah, how do you make acid chlorides? And this, this uh, is a, illustrates something that I think the chapter says. It is difficult to make a more reactive carboxylic acid derivative from a less reactive one. To do this, you need uh, special reagent. So, good question. How do I make the acid chloride? You start with the carboxylic acid, but then you're going to use an old friend from 351, SOCl2. And that will, uh, there is a mechanism here that we could talk about. It's kind of cool, but it's probably not worth our time. Yeah. So, um, we'll call this if you want to convert uh, a more reactive carboxylic acid derivative, all you need is conventional, except we can't spell, conventional nucleophilic acyl substitution. If you want to convert a less reactive carboxylic acid derivative to a more reactive one, you're going to need a special reagent. <laughs> so, all of the stuff above here is not stuff you would need to memorize. Because I haven't shown you the mechanism for this reaction, and because even if I did show you the mechanism, I would still not really be able to tell you the first principles whereby this reaction works, this is a detail you would need to memorize. Probably it has to do with the strength of the bonds formed versus the bonds broken, presumably the sulfur chloro bond in SOCl2 that we break and replace the carbon oxygen bond with the carbon chlorine bond. Presumably, um, that's one of the driving forces. The other driving force, force is that, um, yes, the byproducts are HCl and SO2 gas, which bubbles off. And so there's a strong entropic driving force for this reaction to happen. 
Okay, so we're not going to have time to go through all the intricacies of every possible combination of an acid chloride or an anhydride with a nucleophile, but you don't need to be able to do that. You don't need to be able to, we don't need me to do that for you because it follows from the first principles. When we come back next time, I'm going to talk about how to make esters from carboxylic acids. All right. We'll see you. Have a good day. See you Wednesday.